Thanksgiving week. And so uh, a lot of people are probably tempted to say, well, aren't we going to move on to something else? Well, I think we ought to get hung up on Thanksgiving once in a while. I mean, you know, there's a, there's a lot to be thankful for. We have a, we have a God who does everything for us. We have a God who, who uh, as we just sang, uh, sent the perfect gift to, to us. Uh, I don't have, I don't necessarily have that specifically in my sermon today, but I, but I thought while we were singing that, I thought what a, what a huge amount of, of, uh, of thinking that there, that we need to go through on a regular basis is that just exactly what this salvation story is all about, this idea that, that, that God who created everything, uh, was able to to uh, realize that because of his omniscience, realize that we needed to have a savior, and so he himself laid his own self, his own uh, royalty, if you will, down and allowed himself to be born in this uh, form of a child, of a baby, and go through what we go through, and go through every temptation that we all go through, but. He did it without sin. And none of us can honestly say that we have gone through our life without sin. So uh, so we do have a lot to be thankful for just in Jesus Christ. So um, let's go ahead and, and go to the Lord in prayer, and then I'll read my, my verses for us. Father, we ask you to be with us today in, in the services. Lord, there are many in our community who... Uh, who are uh, not able to come because of quarantine or whatever. And, and, uh, and so thus, little few uh, meet together in your name and ask you to be a part of this and let us uh, worship you just a little while in the Word of God. In Jesus' name, amen. So what we are talking about, I, I, I got hung up on, like I said, I got kind of hung up on Thanksgiving and the thoughts on Thanksgiving. And then, so I thought, well, okay, fine. I'll just put it down, put my thoughts down on paper for a little bit. And, and so the main thing that we need to understand is whenever he says that we should come before him with Thanksgiving, it's not just a thing to just say. It is, it is really true that we need to focus every day of the year on Thanksgiving, not necessarily just the uh, the holiday that we have created for it one day out of the year, but rather that it, day after day after day, every day, we should be um, able to focus our minds and our hearts on Thanksgiving and our thankfulness. And so, uh, I think that I think that if a person will do that. And in and, uh, and, and I, what I did in my own prayer time, you do you do your own thing. But what I do in my own prayer time is I have verses of scripture written out through all of what I like to pray for. And every time I run into one of those verses, I read it back to the Lord. I had an older gentleman uh, preacher one time tell me. He said when he he was telling me what to do uh, as a pastor when that times get tough. And, and, uh, and, and you feel like you're uh, kind of the only one out there. He said, David understands that. So he said, get on your knees and read the Psalms back to God. And I've never thought of it quite in that manner. But if you think about it, it's God's word and it has all the answers. Why couldn't we read it back to him and say, God, this is me. I'm talking. I'm talking back to you. And it's amazing in my prayer time, how many times just exactly what I wanted to say was in a verse that was in scripture. And so when we talk about being thankful, there's a lot of things we can be thankful for, but man, I'm, I'm glad we have the word of God, that it's a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path, that we can actually not just say the words, but that it's true and it's true to the core and therefore in everything that is in Scripture, we need to be ready and willing and, and waiting for the Lord to bring these things to pass that haven't come to pass yet, and glorying and being thankful to the Lord for the things that have. There's a lot of prophecy that has been fulfilled, 
uh, at, at one point, one, one guy came up with about 333, and that's the reason I can remember the number, prophecies on just Jesus himself. Just Jesus. And, uh, you know, and what an incredible thing that is that Jesus fulfilled every one of those things that is, that is in Scripture. And that there are things yet to come, as we were studying in Revelation this morning in Sunday school, there are things yet to come that are going to come to pass just exactly as they have been written. And so uh, I think that's something for us to be thankful for. So my thoughts on Thanksgiving hover around these things. Let's just go on and read. 1 Timothy 4, 1 through 5, uh, it'll be up on the screen. If you've got a Bible, you can look at your own version. Um, do so. But in the ESV, it says, Now the Spirit expressly says that in the latter times, some will depart from the faith by devoting themselves to deceitful spirits and teachings of demons. Now, I, a lot of people don't like to focus on the demonic or, or the demons, uh, but like I said in some school this morning, it's, a, it's real. It is true. So therefore, we shouldn't run from it. We should be armed. We should be armored and know that if we are going to be in this battle called life, there's going to be times when, in, when you are being attacked by something that you can't see. And so, you know, we, when he says here that they'll depart from the faith in, 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 in the end times by devoting themselves to these deceitful spirits and the teachings of demons. Man, we've got to be careful. And that's a reason for reading God's Word regularly is if you, if you focus on God's Word, then you won't get tripped up whenever somebody's using something that isn't God's Word, okay? Through the sincerity of liars are, are, whose consciences are seared, who forbid marriage and require abstinence from foods that God created to be received with thanksgiving by those who believe and know the truth, for everything created by God is good, and nothing is to be rejected if it is received with thanksgiving, for it is made holy by the word of God in prayer. So, as Paul is writing to Timothy, he tells them, now, don't get tripped up by these people that are going to be that are going to be starting to teach these things. See, Paul was expecting it to be uh, to, for the end times to come, just as just like we are today, we still look at it and say, man, the end must be close. The end times must be right on the doorstep. It was the same for Paul. It was the same for Peter. When you read their writings, you've got to understand they were expecting it too at any time. And, and so we don't know how long this age called the church age is going to last. The age of grace is going to last. But we do know this, that whenever God created it, and God blessed it. He told Peter, he said, he showed him this vision of these animals coming down that he, Peter would never have eaten, ever. And he said, oh, Lord, I'm not going to eat that. He said, that's against my Jewish laws. And God said, don't you dare call anything unclean that I have made clean. I think at that point we ought to realize that everything's clean. Thank you, Lord. I like lobster. Okay. <laughs> and I like shrimp. And I like... Uh, I, I like pork, and I like all those things, and I think that, man, I'm sure glad I'm born on this side of it, and I don't have to refrain from eating those things, because God said, as Phil Robertson always puts in his, he says, rise, Peter, kill and eat, you know, <laughs> it's a, that's, that's, his, that's his whole philosophy on life, is that, you know, if it's in there, it ought to be good if you know just how to cook it, we ought to be able to do it, okay? But the main thing that I get out of that whole point is everything is created by God, and it is good. And nothing is to be rejected if it's received with thanksgiving. So my quick question to you is, do you know why we have a, a habit of saying the grace over the, over the meal before we eat? This is it right here. This is what you're looking at. This is where he said, go to the Lord and thank him for it, and it, in a sense, cleanses the meal. 
No, I, I don't think it's a, I don't think that you have to be worried to eat something without saying thank you, Lord. Because I look in scriptures and there's times whenever they gave gave thanks before the meal, there's times when they gave thanks during the meal, there's times when they gave thanks after the meal. So I don't think the timing is important. I think the, the attitude of us is what's important. We need to have an attitude of thanksgiving. So what do we see in scriptures for thanksgiving? And by the way, Christian, if it's in the scripture, then it's there for you. Okay, it's, it, that's, the, that's the really cool thing about God's Holy Spirit interacting through the scriptures that he pinned down through the, the hand of man. He pinned them all down through the hand of man so that he could then be in you and show you things from scripture. It's, a, it's an interactive relationship. And so this is, this is it. It's there for you. It is. First Chronicles 29, 10 through 11 says in the NLT, it says, Then David praised the Lord in the presence of the whole assembly. O Lord, the God of our ancestor Israel, may you be praised forever and ever. Yours, O Lord, is the greatness, the power, the glory, the victory, and the majesty. Everything in the heavens and on earth is yours, O Lord, and this is your kingdom. We adore you as the one who is over all things. Wealth and honor come from you alone, for you rule over everything. Power and might are in your hand, and at your discretion people are made great and given strength. O oh, our God, we thank you and praise your glorious name. He is he's showing us a pattern of gratefulness, grateful for the things that God has given us grateful for the things I think we ought to show gratefulness for the things he didn't give us. There's times whenever you, if you just be honest with yourself, you prayed for something that God said no. And it's a really cool thing knowing that he protected you by saying no. Okay. There's that old country, that's that country music song that says the same thing, but I think it's great. You know, thank God for unanswered prayers. There's times when our lives, when we humans don't have enough foresight to be able to see what is going to happen. But you serve a God who is in the past, in the present, and in the future all at the same time. You see, don't put God in a bottle and try to make him fit your parameters. He is outside of time. He is that which was behind. He is that which is now. And he is that which is to come. And so he is already there. I told a, a, a group of uh, young people one time, and, it, I, and I've always thought of it this way. If you look at time as a, as, as a line, okay, like back of that pew, and you think, okay, here is my, here's my birth, and over there is my death, and I'm somewhere in here in the middle of that. And you think about it in that way, that's, that's what mankind sees. Man sees life as a, and time as a beginning and an end. But when you look at what the way God is, matter of fact, in a, in, in a, a kind of an experiment, uh, some, some physicists got together and they looked at scripture and determined that by reading the scriptures, there are not just three or possibly four dimensions. In God, there are innumerable dimensions of thought. It's not just uh, the, the, you know, length, width, depth, and time, and space, if you want to add a fifth one. It's more than that. There, there are times whenever you look at God and He's way outside of that. And the only way you can put that in your mind to make sense out of things in Scripture is to realize that God does not look necessarily at the beginning and the end, but rather eternity past and eternity forward, and he's in it all, and so he's back, he's back here looking at your little feeble timeline and saying, as he said in scripture, that our life is just as a vapor. It's here for a minute and gone. You know, I woke up this morning real early, and it was far. I mean, you couldn't see the front gate of my yard, and it was dense, dense fog. 
And I thought, boy, this is going to be fun to drive in when we go to church. Guess what? By the time the sun came up, it was gone. Well, where did all that go? It just dissipated away. That's kind of like our life is, is we find that, 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 that our lives are just like a vapor. So sacrifice, so we have a, we have a need to be grateful for the way that the scriptures lay out things. Okay, so let's look at some of those. Sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving. You say, wait a minute, say that again. That you need to sacrifice the sacrifice of thanksgiving. Uh, Psalm 107, 22 says, let them sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving. You thought I was being kind of silly by saying what I said. I got it out of scripture. So sacrifice the sacrifices of thanksgiving and declare his works with rejoicing. So what God wants you to do is, in a sense, sacrifice your own uh, time and your own thoughts and, and your own what you think you want to do. Sacrifice that as a sacrifice to God and, let, and, and, and make it gratefulness for everything. What will that drive you to do? It's your morning prayers. It's your time in, with God. It's the time when we take time to, to look at what we're grateful for and thank God for it and give that to him as, as if it were a sacrifice that you, were, that you had. And remember, sacrificing is the act of bringing the required item and giving it wholly up to God with, and doing that without grudging. Okay? So when God asks you to give, uh, and I'm going to, just for a second, take, in, take the tithe and offerings for a minute. Uh, I'm not going to go into de depth and detail, but if you'll go to Malachi 3.10 and, and read that section of verses, he says there that if we will just give, that he'll pour out more than you can handle. Now, he wasn't just, that's not just flowery speech. In, in Luke 6, 38, he says, Give, and it shall be given unto you. Good measure. That means the same amount. Okay? Press down, shaken together, and running over shall men give into your bosom. And I've explained that before. That's your pocketbook. Okay? For with the same measure that you meet with all, it shall be measured to you again. Okay? So... What it means in, a, in, in the King James English is this. What you give gets given back to you the same measure. So if you give a tithe, is that a giving? Actually, no. The tithe means 10%. And God says, that's mine. So when you give a tithe, you're actually giving what represents what God actually owns, and that's all. So God didn't say, you've got to bring it all and give it back to me. He said, give a tithe, and that tithe will be, will be recognized as you honoring God and saying, it's all yours, God, and you only want it 10% back, so that's the point of view. Okay, all right. God gives you a dollar. He only wants a dime of it back, and what's he, does he need that dime? No. What he's doing is teaching you something that you need to know, and that is it's not yours. And it's when you give it back, the tithe, then you've got to realize that that 10%, he's promised in this, that you can, that it'll be given back to you, but it's going to be given back to you in a measure like you gave it to him. Dip up a, a cup of flour, and you give it to the Lord, he gives you a cup of flour back. I'm just being silly, but this is the way it is. Only then he takes and he and he packs it down in the cup. Now can you get more in it, ladies? When you're baking, can you get more in it if you tamp it down into the cup? So you have to be careful that your good measure means the same amount. Okay, not packed down. Well, God's going to give it to you packed down, and then He's going to slam it down on the counter and He's going to beat it down a little bit more. And then he's going to pour more into it, and then pretty quick, there ain't nothing left to go into the cup, and it's going to be running over onto the counter. That's what God says he will do for you if you'll give. Give the sacrifices of praise, of thanksgiving, and then be thankful for that. 
And matter of fact, he, uh, Malachi 3 also goes on to say that if you, if you bring the tithes into the storehouse, that's, that's what the church represents in your mind, is a storehouse. You can, we're, we're taking up the lot of union offering. We bring a tithe to the church. We give an offering to Lottie Moon. They're different. The tithe is God's. You say, well, God's represented in the Lottie Moon. I tell you, so I can just give my tithe to the Lottie Moon. Well, it's not the way God intended it. The, the way God intended it is the tithe give, goes to the storehouse so that the orphans and the widows and anybody that needs help in the community, we get to help them. So it stays in house. Matter of fact, if you went in the temple, they had storerooms along the, the entryways where they stored the tithes in there because it was actual grains and, and foods, and they gave it back out in the same manner, okay? So just get this down. But he said, bring me the tithes and the offerings. That's where you'll rob God. He said, will a man rob God? Yeah, he'll rob him in tithes and offerings. So God says, 10% of it's mine. But the offering is by grace. You get to give whatever you want. You get to give to help the poor any way you want to. And that's what we've got to see when we say bringing a sacrifice, simply giving that which God gave to you, and then getting excited about it. And, and matter of fact, let me read another verse for you, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. And he says this, each one must give as he has decided in his heart. Wait a minute. The tithe is how much? So wait, tell me. 10%. Tithe percent of what you make. By the way, you will never go broke giving your tithe. You will never do it. God can outgive you a whole lot more than you can imagine. So this is saying whatever you decide in your heart. He's talking to people taking up an offering for another, for another place that is going through a, 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 a time of trouble. And he says, bring me all the he said, bring the tithes together. And he said, each one must give as he's decided in his heart. Not reluctantly. God doesn't want you walking up there going, oh, here we go again. Another one of these any strong offerings. That's grudgingly, okay? And he says, don't bring it like that. Don't give it because the preacher stood up here and said, give, 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 give. Everybody that I know of that, that comes into a church like three times a year, they always gripe because I always talk about giving. We shouldn't gripe about talking about giving. It's the best blessing you'll ever see in your life. If you'll just open up, let a few moths out, and, let, and, and take another dollar bill out and put it in an offering plate, that's an offering, okay? And he says, go ahead and don't do it under compulsion and don't do it grudgingly. But then now here's the key word, key word in here. For God loves a, and I underlined it, cheerful. You know what the word means? The word means hilarious. It actually is the root word that we use, hilarious. It's hilarious. God expect and, and listen, I have... I've seen it happen when people really caught on to giving to the Lord. We, 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 we had, one, we had a, a, a little uh, jug that the kids always put their offering in, pennies and whatnot. And I used to tell people, I'm trying to teach you what a hilarious giver looks like. Because when those kids got used to it, they'd, they'd pick up their pennies and they'd run down the aisle. You said, run to church. Oh, yeah. We, we, we let them have fun. Put it in there. Somebody spilled furs on the floor, and everybody gets down and picks it up and puts it together. It got so it got so fun for the rest of the church that pretty quick adults were jumping up and coming up there with them. And we, of course, whatever was in the kids' this offering uh, got got given to them on the playground or whatever. We made we made sure we used it for the kids. But the point was, is it got so much that one one of the adults started coming up and putting his in their stuff and his dollar bills in the in the neck of that thing and and, uh, and somebody chewed him out. He said, you shouldn't be 
You shouldn't be going up there and making a big issue and all this. Right? That's a grudging giver. The guy that was running down to the front with the kids because he couldn't wait for his own plate to get there. That's a hilarious giver, okay? So God wants us to be hilarious givers, and he wants us to give with thanksgiving, okay? So then what else is, do we see in Scripture that God says to do? Where am I at on time? Oh, I've got a little bit more. Sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving. Oh, guess what else you can bring as, a, as an offering to the Lord? Guys, we all need to pay attention to this because this is something that, like I said in Sunday school, you weren't made this way. Singing is not something you do naturally, so give it as an offering and sing. Okay? You say, I can't sing, I can't carry a tune in a bucket with a lid nailed down. That's all right. God will straighten it out. When it comes to him, he hears it in perfect tone, right? Okay, so sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving. Psalm 147, 7 proves it. He says, sing unto the Lord with thanksgiving. Sing praise upon the harp unto our God. If we were to look at, at Lance as he plays, as, that's what it was intended. There was musical instruments. That, I don't know if you're Church of Christ or not, but if you're listening to this and you don't like instruments in the church, this kind of gets to you. And, and I've had lots of deep conversations with people trying to tell me that instruments don't belong in church. I love hearing all kinds of music off of all kinds of instruments because it praises God. So let us make a joyful noise. He said, come, let us come to his presence with thanksgiving. Let us, make, let us make a joyful noise to him with songs of praise, Psalm 95, uh, 2. And he says that we should enter into his gates. So where are we going to sing? Well, enter into his gates. And I take that to mean the, the church. It's, it's important for the church to meet together, people. Well, I know we didn't meet together for the last couple of weeks. We're trying to let this thing dissipate a little bit. But it is vital to keep coming to church. It is vital. And, and, and if it kills us, oh well. I know she's not going to like that statement, but the truth is, as he said, enter into my gates with thanksgiving and into my courts with praise. He says in Psalm 100, verse 4, enter into his gates. Does that sound like a repetitive theme? No. Okay. Into his gates with thanksgiving and into his courts with praise. Be thankful unto him and bless his name. See, it's all about thanksgiving. Psalm 95, 2. Let us come before his presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto him with psalms. Hmm. I told you what joyful noise means, didn't I, before? It's not about pretty. It's about volume. It's whenever we sing, we should sing. And we ought to enjoy what we bring to the Lord. Think about this for a minute. God's not asking anything of you that you can't give joyfully. Yes, the tithe is his. Ten percent of it is his. That represents that you recognize that everything is his. And then he puts in, and he says, you want to give a, 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 an offering? Give a little more and do it with a hilarious feeling in your heart, a cheerful feeling. And give a little bit more. That's where Lottie Moon comes in. That's where Annie Armstrong comes in. That's where all of these other offerings that we that we take up, it's not to take your tithe and put it in there. It's to take an offering and experience what it's like when you give and he gives back to you. Press down, shaken together, running over. God's going to give it back to you. You said, oh, I've seen it or I've given it and it come back. You have too short a patience. Give God time. Give God time. You'll see, you'll see something happen. You want to know something funny about God? This is hilarious, but this is the way God works. A lot of times, whenever it comes to giving back, I'm going to use Clint. You don't mind, do you? But I, 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 Clint has a need. He's got something he needs. And he's prayed for it, and he said, God, I'm going to trust you to help me with this. I, I have a need. You know what? God sometimes puts it in my pocket. What in the world? What in the world? Where'd that come from? And God will go, Clint needs it. 
Now you got two tests going on. Plants praying for something for help. And God put it in my pocket and God laid it on my heart and said, give it to Clint. Now it's my obedience to give to Clint what God gave to me because God told me that. Now, it doesn't mean it happens all the time, but if there's a point where it happens, how am I supposed to act with that? Oh, well, God, that's mine. You, you, it, it showed up in my billfold. No, that ain't the way to go. That's grudgingly. Okay? He wants you to give it cheerfully, without grudging, and excited to see what's going to happen. Have you ever done this? Have you ever enjoyed the, the, the experience of being in a restaurant? And I used to work in the oil field, so I was always eating in restaurants, breakfast or whatever. And all of a sudden, God would lay it on my heart. He'd say, you see that, see that elderly lady over there? Buy her, buy her lunch. Buy her breakfast. The first time it happened to me, I was like, what in the world? You know? And then I did it. And then all of a sudden, I got this. I, it got exciting. I couldn't do it enough. I got to where I was. I got to where there was an elderly man that came into Moab all the time. And one of the waitresses and I, I'd go in for breakfast early in the morning. And, and they were about the only diner open early in the morning. I'd go in and I'd sit down. Mainly, I could have cooked my own egg, and I did a lot of times. But the, I, a lot of times I'd go in there just to talk to the staff while they were getting ready for, for the day. And so the ladies got to where they were used to me and whatnot. And I got to where I, I'd noticed that this elderly man came in also about the same time. And he always ordered the same thing. And he always, you could tell he was living on. Uh, Subsistence. He, he had an income of some kind of, uh, and he was all alone, and he would come in and he'd eat his breakfast, and then you wouldn't see him again until the next morning. And so I, I got this crazy thought in my head one time. God, God said, give her a hundred dollars and tell her every time he comes in, buy his breakfast. What in the world? Guess what I did? I got to notice that I had been given a hundred dollars by somebody for no reason. They just said, here, I need to see how it goes. Somebody else felt that they needed to help me. And they gave me a $100 bill. And I still had it in my wallet. So I pulled out that $100 bill and I gave it to her. And I said, give it to him. You know, buy his breakfast with it. And don't tell him. It got so exciting, I couldn't hardly shut it off. It was so fun. You can ask my wife. I started pulling out money out of the account to put in my wallet so that I could so that I could leave a hundred dollar tip once in a while. You say, that's nuts. It's hilarious is what it is. Because what I found is I all of a sudden my bills started dwindling. I didn't look this verse up. I already left my Bible out there. Go to go to that, go to where I told you in Malachi. Malachi 3. And Becky, this isn't on there. Yeah. Um but I want to show you something that's hidden in here, and we sometimes forget it. Bring you all the time into the storehouse, and that there that there may be meat in my house. See, there's you're, you're giving. They were given actual uh, meat could mean grain or meat or whatever into my house. And prove me now herewith, saith the Lord of hosts, if I will not open you the windows of heaven and pour you out a blessing, that there shall not be room enough to receive it. That's a promise. That's a promise, right? But now we sometimes we overlook verse 11. And I will rebuke the devourer for your sake. Huh. What in the world does that mean? And he shall not destroy the fruits of your ground, neither shall your vine cast your fruit or fruit before the time in the field, saith the Lord of hosts. He says, I'll not only give it back to you, more than you can handle, he said, I'll start shutting off some of the things that are devouring the cash out of your bill. And I read that and I thought, oh, could that be? And you know what I experienced? This is me. I'm not, I'm not telling you what you've experienced. I'm telling you what I've experienced. God started shutting off bills that we had coming in that is all of a sudden getting paid off. And you said, well, you did that. Did, but I didn't know where the money was coming from. It just was there. God is 
is going to take care of you. So when you, I didn't intend to start out this whole sermon on, on, on tithe and offerings, but it's, it's, a, it's a great opportunity. Thanks, Thanksgiving. The, pl the plan of, of giving, not to get back, but giving because God told you to, and then getting excited and starting to give more and seeing somebody blessed by it. And all of a sudden, God says, look at that little orphanage. They need food, or they need this, or they need that. And we have been, as a church, been able to help them and get together and give an offering and take it to them and do the things that we do for them. And all of a sudden, it gets exciting, and it gets, it gets to where all of a sudden it's, it's like you've got a part in that orphanage, and those little kids start, you start trying to read her, her little notes that she writes up on Facebook or wherever so that you can see what it's doing for those kids, knowing that we had a part in that. That's giving. Not, oh, good grief, preacher, I wish you'd shut up about giving. Oh, I don't think we could get excited enough about giving. I think that giving is the answer to a lot of our needs is because we're too close fisted. You got a dent in every penny you own. You know, come on, back up and let, let's, let's look at what God's attitude is. God said, give it away and see what I do. Give it away and see what I do. Check out your Thanksgiving attitude. You ready for this? This is something I don't and I wrote this one. Where I got it, who wrote it, whatever, don't matter. I am thankful for. These are things I'm thankful for. I'm thankful for the mess to clean up after a party because it means that I was surrounded by friends. I I'm thankful for the taxes that I paid because it means that I had employment or income. I'm thankful for the clothes that fit a little bit too tight because it means that I had enough to eat. <laughs> I'm thankful for my shabby who watches me work because it means that I'm out in the sunshine. <laughs> I'm thankful for a lawn that needs to be mowed and windows that need cleaning and gutters that need fixing because I, it means I have a home. I could add to that one and tractors to fix and, 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 and vehicles that won't run. And I'm grateful for these things because it means that I have something. I'm thankful for the, all the complaining that I hear about our government because it means that we have freedom of speech. I am thankful for the spot that I find at the end of the far end of the parking lot because it means I'm capable of walking. You can tell that one I wrote way a long time ago because that now I don't feel that thankfulness, okay? I, 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 like, I like not having to walk, okay? <laughs> I'm thankful for my huge heating bills because it means that at least I was warm. I'm, I'm thankful for the lady behind me in church who sings off key because it means I can hear. <laughs> I'm thankful for the piles of laundry and ironing because it means my loved ones are around me. I'm thankful for weariness and aching muscles at the end of the day because it means that I've been productive. I'm thankful that the alarm goes off in the early morning hours because it means I'm alive. Amen? Amen. You can find things to be thankful for. You can find things to thank God for in every situation. And so when these things occur, don't be, don't be grudging about your sacrifice or thanksgiving to God. Say thank you. We all, we all, I don't know what that was, but I did it, I'm sure. We all have a, a life to live that brings every occasion to be thankful. What we need to do is be able to surrender ourselves, and remember that's what sacrifice means, surrender it all over to God and give Him thanks for it all. The good and the bad, the things that you don't understand, the times whenever you go, but it's family, 
It's my kids. How can I possibly be thankful for this? Thank God anyway and see what happens. If, if, he's, if he's right, and he is, then giving thanks to him for bad situations is no different than giving a little bit of money you didn't think you had. And he promised to press down, shaking together, running over. Don't get narrow in the, your time frame of when he wants to do it. It may take the rest of your life to see it come back. I don't know. I don't even know who I'm talking to right now, but I'm saying don't give up. Thank God. Thank God. Thank God. For everything.